So I've been thinking a lot recently about the reviewing process or more specifically how we might present data that may be more relevant to your next video card purchase. And that got me thinking about why people might actually be upgrading. Sure, increased performance is one thing, but another key driver is the move to a higher resolution display. So here's the thing, a lot of my recent reviews have centered on 1440p performance, even if AMD or Nvidia are touting their latest and greatest mainstream cards as 1080p champions. In my opinion, products like the 1660 Super, 5600 XT, RTX 2060, all great 1440p performers. And I reckon you get more GPU utilization, more value from the silicon at that resolution. And I also reckon a ton of you may be considering moving on from 1080p to 1440p as your primary display. And why not? After all, the improvement is pretty huge in terms of image quality. So this is a different type of GPU review. It's not so much a singular product review, but rather aiming to match specific products to the 1080p to 1440p upgrade process. Now for me, if I upgraded my screen, I'd want performance on par or better than what I'm experiencing at Full HD. And that's exactly how we've plundered the Digital Foundry GPU database for this video. We've gone through each of our key games, tracked performance at 1080p on two of the biggest selling GPUs of all time and matched them up to 1440p frame rates from the latest wave of video cards. Those two base cards? Well, we kick off with the legendary GeForce GTX 970 running at reference specs. Now this was a controversial product back in the day, what with its split VRAM configuration, but it's a card that absolutely dominated the Steam hardware survey for years, a genuine classic. The second card, well, it's the 970's kind of spiritual successor, if you like, the GTX 1060. Another enormous sales success and another great 1080p performer. Stick around and I may even show you how the GTX 1070 scales as well another massive seller. I mean, as successful as the 1060 was, it is beginning to fall short for consistent 60 FPS gaming. And you might have upgraded to a 1070 in the meantime. I mean, the Steam hardware survey definitely suggests that a lot of you did. But with all that said, there's something I want to stress before we move on. It's something we've talked about at length in the past at Digital Foundry. Ultra settings. Some might say it's a criminal waste of your GPU resources. And I'm going to demonstrate it spectacularly right now. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, 1080p, ultra high. We benchmark at this setting and a ton of other sites do as well. It has a reputation for absolutely brutal performance and you can see it right here. Mid 30s, early 40s on GTX 1060 at just 1080p. Wow. Well, obviously the hit will be quite severe as we move up to 1440p on the same GPU. I mean, we're talking about a 77% increase in resolution. And yeah, that frame rate hit is palpable. However, just by moving the volumetric cloud setting down from ultra to very high, you can see that suddenly we've clawed back half of the performance deficit, moving down to the high setting just on volumetric clouds. There are points in the bench where the same hardware is delivering the same frame rate at 1080p and 1440p. Quite remarkable. So before we go on, there are two things I want to stress. First of all, there is no specific linear relationship between resolution and performance. We're talking about a 77% increase to pixel count moving from 1080p to 1440p. And on the 1060, we're paying for it with a 28% drop in frame rate. By lowering volumetric clouds from ultra high to high, well, the performance drop is now just 4.5%. 1080p with prettier clouds or 1440p uh, without. Bit of a no-brainer, right? In many respects, Ultra Settings gives PC developers the chance to show off their technologies pushed to the nth degree, but should you actually use them for smooth performance though? These systems, like the volumetric clouds, are designed around a console target, and high settings is console equivalent and looks absolutely fine. Now, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, bit of an extreme example perhaps, and uh, yeah, sometimes you'll need to tweak more than one setting, but I think I've made my point. Now let's get into the meat and drink of this particular analysis, where we will be comparing like-for-like -like workloads. This isn't about gameplay, this is about performance under the most challenging conditions, and yeah, years on, a super tough workout for scalability comes from my favourite, Crisis 3. 
looking at GTX 1060 first. To achieve nigh on identical performance of 1440p, the upgrade of choice here is the RTX 2060. There are still select areas of the bench where the 1060 at 1080p is faster, but yeah, this is the closest match we have Nvidia side. And we need to push higher on AMD up to the 5700 for a similar effect. Throughout the vast majority of the bench, we're on par or better than the 1060 at 1080p. GTX 970 equivalent performance. Yeah, I reckon Nvidia did some crazy driver optimization back in the day on this one, which benefited the Maxwell cards in an era where people other than lunatics like me still use this game as a benchmark. Remarkably, the 2060 is still the closest fit as a 1440p upgrade. AMD side, a lot of the bench plays out just as well on the RX 5600 XT with the overclocked BIOS, but again, for a conclusive improvement in performance, 5700 it is. Now, Crisis 3 chuckles mockingly at the efficiency drives inherent in modern GPU architectures, but Battlefield 1, the Frostbite engine, positively adores them, and so correspondingly, the requirement for like-for-like -like performance going from 1080p to 1440p drops. GTX 1660 Ti is the closest match here, and chances are an overclocked 1660 Super will do a similarly good job. AMD side, the 5500 XT didn't quite do the job, but the 5600 XT without the OC BIOS has a ginormous advantage here. Looking at the old 970, well now the performance requirement drops and a 1660 gets equivalent performance at 1440p and the 5500 XT just as fast. Now this is a demanding area of the game actually and every GPU we test here is still above 60 frames per second, so not bad, right? So let's stop for a second because we're actually seeing something quite remarkable here. GTX 1060 at 1080p Crisis needs an RTX 2060 to pull off similar perf at 1440p. This is a card that sits at the top of tier 3 in our GPU power ladder. However, the 1660 and 5500 XT are fine for Battlefield 1. These are cards that sit within tier 4 on the ladder. Quite a spread then. Far Cry 5 next, which in the mid-range does rather like AMD kit. The non-OC 5600 XT is the nearest AMD equivalent that presents the same performance and better, only this time it's not just a little bit better, it's a ton better. GTX 1660 Ti, closest match Nvidia side. So are you happy with your performance numbers on GTX 970 at 1080p? Well, to equal that at 1440p, we actually needed a 1660 Super, while on the AMD side, a cheapest chips RX 590 is only a touch slower across most of the benchmark. Now RX 590, the Polaris chip, this is a classic 1080p champ and uh, well, as we're demonstrating here, it's actually a pretty good 1440p performer as well. Okay, let's stop again and point out something I do hope is spectacularly obvious. We're not comparing on a price basis here or even on a price versus performance basis. These are the sort of things we try to cover in a standard GPU review. We're looking for the closest match in equivalent performance to our existing 1080p champions. The idea here is that we build enough data points to show how classic 1080p GPUs can be replaced with an equivalent that will do just as well, if not better, at 1440p. As for final recommendations, well, we'll come to those later. Returning to the benches though, Ghost Recon Wildlands, a game where ultra settings attempts to set fire to your GPU. A 1660 Ti at 1440p is good enough to match 1060's 1080p output, while a 5600 XT with no OC BIOS is the closest AMD equivalent yet, still delivering a big perf overhead. GTX 970 at this point, 1660 or 5500 XT will do the job just fine at 1440p. So I think there are games that like the Turing architecture, and there are other titles that aren't quite so friendly to it. And that opens up the spread in the replacement GPU required to get equivalent 1440p performance. I've talked in the past about Rise of the Tomb Raider favoring older architecture. So to match 1060's benchmark results, you need a meaty RTX 2060 or a 5600 XT. However, looking at the sequel, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the requirement to match 1060 per drops to a 1660 Ti. Again, 5600 XT is the closest match AMD side. No OC BIOS required. 
The Witcher 3 sits at a bit of an odd point in performance profiling. The closest match for the 1060 we could come up with was the 2060 and the non-OC 5600 XT. Yet both of these cards are a good lick faster. GTX 970, well I find this one quite intriguing. 1660 Super at 1440p matches 970 at 1080p, while the RX 590, again a card typically associated with great 1080p gaming, does the job here at 1440p. Finally, something to point out is the thorny issue of VRAM. We've only got 4 gigs of the stuff on GTX 970 and only 3.5 gigs of really fast stuff. And here's one of our classic legacy benchmarks showing the impact of this. Assassin's Creed Unity. The performance differential is much higher than it should be. I think the driver is artificially limiting frame rate to stop stutter occurring as assets are shuttled in and out of RAM. Our other test titles can accommodate a 1080p frame buffer in 4 gigs of RAM, so the 970 isn't as badly affected in those other games, but it will affect far more titles at 1440p. And the only way forward there is really to lower texture resolution, something I wouldn't really want to do at a higher pixel count. With that in mind, these days I just wouldn't recommend a 4 gig card for 1440p gaming if you're looking for any type of future proofing. You'll note here that uh, Assassin's Creed Unity, another demanding legacy game requiring an RTX 2060 or an overclocked 5600 XT to match 1060 performance at 1440p. So let's sum up the data we have here. If replacing a 1060 with a 1440p equivalent, the data overwhelmingly suggests a 1660 Ti or an RTX 2060 on the Nvidia side and a 5600 XT on the AMD side, and you might as well uh, go for an overclock model there. The only outlier here is perennial troublemaker Crisis 3, which is demanding an RX 5700. If you've got a card with GTX 970 level performance and you're looking to get the same results at a higher resolution, 1440p, the card you'll need, the results we're getting much more diverse. Anything from a 1660 to a 2060 is needed for equivalent performance. It's quite surprising how an RX 590 proves capable on a number of titles. Only Crisis and Rise of the Tomb Raider really need anything more powerful than a 5500 XT. One thing I want to stress though is that a RAM upgrade is just as essential for 1440p gaming uh, alongside a boost to compute. Now you might be wondering about 4K, right? Well, let's just limit ourselves to our good cop, bad cop double act of Crisis 3 and Battlefield 1. Good news first. RTX 2080 Super delivers the same fidelity as the 1060 with four times the resolution, while Radeon 7 is just a smidgen slower. On the more challenging, problematic side of the equation, Crisis 3 on GTX 1060 running at 1080p delivers much higher frame rates than 2080 Ti operating at 4K. And clearly, Crytek's final hurrah for the nano suit laughs in the face of AMD's best, the Radeon 7. So, I promised you some GTX 1070 love earlier on in the video, but let's just limit ourselves here to those same extreme cases. So yeah, here's what you need for equivalent 1440p performance. Getting the nastiness out of the way first, you're going to need a pretty expensive RTX 2080 to match Crisis 3's performance level at 1440p. And while the Radeon 7 can't quite match the 1070's Full HD frame rate at the higher resolution, it's the closest thing AMD has. On the more positive end of the equation, Battlefield 1 really is a marvel. The requirement drops to an RTX 2070 in this case. And on the AMD side, RX 5700 will serve you well. It seems the higher up the resolution chain you go, the more the variance between the GPUs required to get equivalent performance, certainly in terms of pricing. Some level of compromise on your settings is probably going to be needed then. Final recommendations then. Well, look, the age-old advice to buy the most capable GPU you can within budget remains in full effect here. If you own a GTX 1060 and a 1080p screen and you're looking to upgrade to 1440p, perhaps the biggest surprise here though is that a 1660 Ti is surprisingly capable for a card that's kind of labelled as a really good 1080p performer. And it is, it's just that as I said earlier, there's no uh, specific linear relationship between pixel count and performance. And when you consider that the 1660 Super is so close to Ti performance, Chances are that a relatively simple overclock 
will get you where you need to be while saving quite a bit of money. I've seen supers available for 200 pounds or uh, you know under 230 dollars. That's excellent value for a card that would do a great job for 1440p gaming. Around 40 to 60 pounds and just a few more of your US bucks gets you the RTX 2060, which is kind of what the data is really telling you to get to cover all eventualities. AMD wise, well, the 5600 XT comes up really often. We knew it was a good 1440p card, but now we have the actual data to see how closely it matches up to 1080p performance on actual mass market sellers. Remember though that the 2060 does have a more future-proof feature set. And if you're all in on an AMD purchase, RX 5700 seems to be on sale quite a lot at the moment at some pretty good prices. And I would take that over the 5600 XT. So there we are, a GPU review with a difference, geared more towards an actual upgrade path many of you are likely to take and one that I wholeheartedly recommend. In a world where a 1660 Super with a mild overclock turns out to be a rather competent 1440p performer, the question is really how much such a GPU is being underutilized at 1080p. I honestly think that putting aside eSports scenarios, it's time to move on from Full HD. 1440p, especially with variable refresh rate functionality, really is a huge improvement. But that's all from me for now. Please do like and subscribe to support the work we do at Digital Foundry. And if you aren't aware that ringing the bell endows you with instant notifications when we post new content, well, now you are aware. Shout out again to the DF Patreon supporters, and I can't stress how much you help myself Tom, John and Alex in producing the content we want to produce on our own terms. So yeah, thanks for that. And if you love what we do, please join and gain access to pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this somewhat data heavy presentation. And yeah, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.